Hello, I'm Kaisa. This video lecture is part of the course on spatial land use planning. Today's lecture is all about zonation and spatial conservation prioritization. In this first part, we will focus on the inputs of a zonation analysis. And I will explain to you how the analysis works. You will get familiar with the way zonation ranks locations on the basis of conservation value and how exactly is that conservation value modeled and calculated within the prioritization. We will go through ample examples on different objectives of a zonation analysis. So after this video, you should be have a good understanding on what zonation can be used for. We have looked at this landscape of grid cells in an earlier lecture and we saw it through the lenses of conservation biology and landscape ecology. Now let's approach the same landscape as a spatial conservation planner would do. We kind of take a step back here and concentrate more on the structure of the landscape. We observe the distributions of biodiversity features and examine the data layers consisting of raster grids. The ecological knowledge, for example, that relating to habitat quality and population dynamics is nevertheless forgotten. We include the ecological patterns and processes into a model of conservation value. The idea that conservation value can be and often is modeled in our heads is the one thing that I wish to emphasize on this course. The model of conservation value is a multifaceted concept that is utilized throughout any spatial conservation planning project. Indeed, all land use planning utilizes valuations. What is the purpose of planning and which actions are preferred? The question of what should be conserved is not an easy one to answer. Using zonation, the answer lies in the case-specific definition of the model of conservation value. Put simply, the model consists of those things we want to prioritize in the landscape we are analyzing. These aspects can include biodiversity, ecological processes, threatened species and habitats, and spatial characteristics such as connectedness of habitats. People, scientists included, read and value landscapes subjectively and this affects the way the model of conservation value is defined. Species area relationship and island biogeographical theory that were introduced in the previous lecture often form the basis for ecologists' models of conservation value. As simplified, more habitat is good, habitat quality needs to be raised, and fragmentation is bad. The mathematical formula of species area relationship represents one quantitative model of conservation value. When it is explained by words, it transforms into a mental model where the amount of habitat and richness of species are seen as utmost priority. So nation is a computational method and thus it needs that conservation value is defined mathematically. The development of any mathematical model of conservation value needs tight interaction with development of a qualitative model of conservation value. It is extremely important to define and communicate the model of conservation value both qualitatively and quantitatively as part of a planning process. It is likely that not all stakeholders agree with the initial value model and thus it needs to be refined in a way that everyone involved agrees and understands it. After all, it is the model of conservation value that gives the basic principle upon which the spatial prioritization works. <laughs> 
Okay, just to remind you that there are certain mental traps that can make it hard to define conservation value in a waterproof way. The common presumption in conservation planning include following things. Firstly, we often presume that vegetation type can be used as a reasonable proxy for habitat availability for one or many species. Secondly, we commonly assume that protecting locations with the most populations of a species will maximize the chances of persistence in both the short and long-term survival. And thirdly, we assume that structural connectivity measured on the basis of land cover types is a reasonable proxy for functional connectivity of multiple species. All these presumptions easily translate into the model of conservation value. If it is feasible to make any of these assumptions, the choice should be conscious. Among these three things, connectivity as a concept is probably not that familiar to you yet, but no worries, we will get back to connectivity in later lectures. Now that we know that the model of conservation value is at the heart of spatial conservation prioritization and that we need to define conservation value mathematically using spatial data in order to run the prioritization, we get to zonation. So what actually is zonation? Zonation is two things at the same time. It is a conservation prioritization framework and a software that does calculations. The end result of a zonation analysis is a map that shows the locations of the analyzed landscape as ranked by their importance in terms of modeled conservation value. Starting from a full landscape, zonation removes locations or grid cells with least priority in an iterative manner. The order of cell removal gives locations the ranked priority which can be drawn on a map as shown here. The cell removal process thus produces a hierarchical zoning of the landscape. Locations with the highest conservation priority are found at the so-called top fraction of the prioritizations. The high rank locations are the last to be removed during the analysis. Zonation aims for persistence and representativeness of biodiversity features by default and it takes into account area, quality and aggregation of different features during the prioritization analysis. In practice, Zonation is a computer program and its user interface looks like this. The Zonation program runs a spatial analysis based on data and parameters that are defined by the user, as shown here in the project view window. The map view shows the visual output of the prioritization. It is the rank map that gives a hierarchical prioritization of the conservation value of a landscape. The red color here shows the most important locations, whereas blue color shows areas with least priority. Zonation has been developed by Professor Atte Moilanen and his research group in University of Helsinki. The main developers include Atte himself, Federico Montesino Bosols, and Jarno Leppänen. The first version of the program was launched about 20 years ago, and currently the fourth version is used. There is a user manual available for each Zonation version, and the program itself can be downloaded for free from the internet. All right, that was the software. But actually, running the prioritization is only one part of the process of conservation planning. Developing a Zonation analysis actually includes a lot of talking, a lot of collaboration, a lot of expert input and engagement, which is invaluable in planning and in evaluating an analysis. Things that need to be discussed include biodiversity features and their distributions, the data availability, threats about persistence of features, usually ecologically defined, 
conservation preferences and objectives and other social aspects caused the economics of conservation and socio-political constraints. It is good to remember that zonation does not do everything. So what zonation is not? Basically, zonation is not a statistical species distribution modeling tool. Zonation is not a tool designed primarily for connectivity analysis and corridor analysis. And zonation is not a general purpose geographic information system. In addition to these three things, Zonation is not a landscape pattern analysis tool or a population viability analysis tool. Well, what does zonation do then? Zonation does spatial prioritization, taking into account cost efficiency and complementarity of data features, and it aims for a balanced outcome where all features retain some level of representation. During the prioritization, zonation tries to retain as much as possible. It aims for a balanced, optimal solution where all biodiversity features are present as long as possible. Complementarity means that the network of prioritized locations together form a solution that fulfills the defined conservation goals. In other words, the different sites that are chosen to be protected complement each other in terms of the range of prioritized features, restrictions and cost efficiency. Biodiversity features are read into the analysis as data layers and they can include spatial distributions of species, habitats, ecosystems, ecosystem services, for example. Biodiversity features typically are ecological factors that contribute to the model of conservation value. Restrictions of the analysis often are social factors, including land tenure or administrative issues. These factors guide the analysis to plausible parts of implementation. Then zonation also takes costs into account. Zonation understands costs both strictly economically, as in land prices, but costs can be dealt with also in broader terms. For example, the opportunity costs for different stakeholders can be taken into account. Perhaps the most important cost calculation zonation produces is that the prioritization is able to show the costs of alternative conservation solutions to biodiversity. Typical questions addressed by zonation analysis fall into these broad categories. Firstly, zonation is able to recognize ecologically valuable areas. Secondly, zonation is able to recognize less valuable areas. Thirdly, zonation is able to give information to evaluate existing conservation areas. And fourthly, zonation can help in designing conservation area networks and extensions. Here is one practical example of a zonation analysis done by Lehtomäki and colleagues here in Finland. The aim here was to identify the best possible locations for expansion of protected forests. Both state-owned and private forests were included in the analysis and existing protected areas were considered as forming the core network that should be supported. The analysis was restricted so that existing protected areas were forced into the most valuable part of the landscape or so-called top fraction. The unprotected forests ranked near to the top fraction showed the ecologically most important areas for protected area network expansion and the forest with low priority ranks showed the least important areas where the possible conflict between conservation value and forest usage could be minimized. Here the difference between questions number one and number two is in which part of the priority ranking are we interested in? 
Then thirdly, the analysis done here was able to evaluate the conservation value of the existing protected areas as compared to the forests that were proposed to be protected on the basics on the basis of the prioritization. In addition to protection, zonation can also be used in allocation of habitat management and restoration activities, targeting of conservation incentives or subsidies, and planning for biodiversity offsets. Here is an example of my own work that combines all of the above mentioned objectives. The driving question of this zonation analysis was, if we were to expand the current network of managed semi-natural grasslands and wood pastures, where should new management be allocated? What biodiversity gains would we get? The starting point was that the species and habitats dependent on low intensity grazing and mowing are rapidly vanishing and the current level of management action is insufficient. Using data from field surveys, we ran a prioritization of ecologically targeted management and detected key areas whose management would safeguard thousands of threatened species populations and maintain a representative network of semi-natural grasslands and wood pastures. The extent of the allocated management effort would be a little more than twice the current management level, thus increased resources are needed together with systematic targeting of the management action in order to reach the biodiversity gains. So, zonation so can do many fancy things, but the basic principle of the analysis is actually quite simple. Load in the input data features. Start from a full landscape let zonation remove one location with least priority at the time. Repeat until there are no locations left. The order of removal gives locations the ranked priority. The major features that contribute to the way zonation runs the prioritization include feature-specific weights and connectivity, uncertainty and costs, species and community level prioritization can be done, balancing between alternative land uses, taking into account landscape condition and retention, and prioritization across administrative regions. To sum up, we have lots of options to refine the analysis. The zonation monster will eat everything that you wish to feed to it. However, it is advisable to start with the simplest setup possible. Let's go to the very basics. How does zonation work? First, we need data. We can use, for example, the Corine land cover data that is in raster format. Input data can originate from raster or vector formats, but vector data need to be rasterized as zonation runs matrix calculations on rasters. If the original data has many features in it, those need to be separated into several data layers. Here the forest pixels have been extracted from the combined land cover data set. Also continuous probability surfaces can be used. Binary data such as species occurrences are okay, and so are different numerical data sets, as long as the value attributes have a spatial location that can be translated into a grid of cells. Remember that data considerations and data availability were among the topics that need to be discussed when planning a zonation analysis. The input data can come from various sources. It can be based on expert knowledge, spatial models, or direct or indirect observations, including remote sensing and field surveys. So this is the zonation framework in terms of prioritization analysis set up. First, a clear definition of the conservation problem is essential to begin with. 
conservation actions that answer to the need posed in that conservation problem can be, for example, establishment of protected areas, restoration or management. Based on the conservation objective and defined actions, an initial model of conservation value can be developed. Then we can start searching for relevant data, select the biodiversity features and determine whether they need to be weighted differently in the prioritization. Also additional inputs relating to connectivity, costs and constraints can be included. As the setup is refined, also the model of conservation value becomes more detailed. When the plan is ready enough, it is time to run the zonation analysis. It is typical to produce several solutions along the way so that we can keep track on how the priority ranking changes as the analysis becomes more and more complicated. Note that zonation cannot do multiple objective planning. That is, it will not allocate areas for different land uses unless they have opposite purposes, such as strict protection and intensive production. One important aspect in planning a zonation analysis is constraints. We really cannot escape constraints. And constraints mean that there are restrictions to the feasibility of prioritization solutions. Not everything is possible to achieve and implement. Constraints can relate to resources, actions or knowledge. If relevant constraints are not taken into account, any prioritization will end up with imaginary solutions that lack practicability. Thus, constraints should be accounted for in the best possible way. Some constraints are easy to deal with, for example, monetary resources or conservation limits in terms of area. Qualitative constraints, on the other hand, are difficult to include in a computational analysis. These include socio-political aspects and people's values and preferences. However, bypassing qualitative constraints with the argument, we don't have the data, is really not a good practice at all. With the information gained from the stakeholders and the collaborative planning team, it often is possible to come up with a way to indirectly include also qualitative constraints into zonation analysis. Next, let's unpack the zonation meta-algorithm. So how does the prioritization work? First, start from full landscape. Then determine the cell or the location that has the least marginal conservation value and remove it. Then update occurrence levels of features in the remaining landscape. Repeat phases two and three until no cells remain in the landscape. So the sites within the analyzed landscape are ranked based on occurrence levels of data features, costs, connectivity and other considerations. This is the main working principle behind zonation. So how does the model of conservation value translate into iterative cell removal? Here we have a simplified example of a single data feature within a 3 by 3 grid cell landscape. Let's say that these absolute values are volumes of observed dead wood per cell. In terms of conservation value, we wish to conserve the cells with the highest volume of dead wood. First, we need to normalize the absolute values by calculating the proportion of dead wood occurring in each cell in relation to the total amount of dead wood in the landscape. So, for example, this normalized value in this cell is basically just this divided by the total sum of dead wood. Then we look at the normalized values and find the smallest one and remove that location from the landscape. And now that we have less grid cells in the landscape, 
we need to recalculate the normalized values. And now again, search for the smallest value and remove that location. And this is repeated round after round. One cell at a time is removed until there are no cells left to be removed. So this order of cell removal is translated into the priority rank of the landscape. Here we can see that that cell which originally had the highest absolute value of dead wood volume is the most important cell in relation to the conservation value that we utilized in the prioritization. Okay, then what if we have multiple biodiversity features? Here is a more realistic example using three different data layers. Let's say that the colors could be distributions of different species. Thus, we have data on three species and we wish to take all of them into account while running the prioritization. First, vector data is rasterized using the same cell size and grid for each layer. Now we have data layers with cell grids aligned with each other. A colored cell means that the species occurs there. This means that we have binary presence absence type data. Then the normalized cell values are calculated. Note that the rarest feature, the blue layer, has the highest values. This is because the value in each cell is in proportion to the whole distribution of that feature. Next, the feature layers are put on top of each other and the aggregate conservation value is calculated for each cell. Look carefully at those cells where the layers overlap. There was a small change. In this example, the aggregate conservation value of a cell is the sum of values over all three layers occurring within that location. This is the model of conservation value in mathematical terms in this example. Now we can choose which cell can be removed so that the overall conservation value within the landscape suffers the least. From the cells with least aggregate conservation value, zonation removes the one that lies on the edge of the combined distribution of all features. The cell that was removed was this one over here. Whether the removal targets peripheral cells or not can be controlled for by using an optional edge removal parameter. So that was the first round of zonations iteration. The purple feature layer lost one cell. Now in the beginning of next round, we look again at the normalized values of each feature layer separately. As the distribution of purple layer changed, its values are recalculated. When a feature gets eaten up by the prioritization, it gets rarer. When the distributions of the feature get smaller, they gain relative value. This is because zonation gives higher value to rare features by default, meaning that the fraction of distribution in one cell and thus its conservation value is higher within a feature that is rare in the analyzed landscape. A feature with high fractions of rare features is automatically given higher aggregate conservation value and thus the prioritization retains those locations as long as possible. So if we were to continue working on this example, we would again put all layers on top of each other, calculate the aggregate conservation value for cells with overlapping features and choose which cell to remove. 
the removal process would be repeated round after another as long as there are cells remaining in the landscape. The cell removal rule defines how the loss in conservation value is calculated as a result of removing a given location. Sometimes it makes more sense to speak about location removal rule because not all zonation analyses operate on grid cells. Or they operate on grid cells, but they don't remove grid cells. Some utilize larger spatial entities that consist of several grid cells. These are called planning units. Also, it is possible to remove more than one cell or location at a time. This adjustment is called the warp factor in zonation. In addition, zonation has different methods on how to calculate the marginal loss in conservation value. These different cell removal rules implement different conceptions of conservation value. Although the meta-algorithm or the working principle of zonation cannot be changed, the cell removal rule can be adjusted and this adds flexibility to the usage of zonation. There are five alternative cell removal rules which have different aims and value feature representation differently. So different analyses need different ways to determine which locations should be removed and which should be preserved. First, we have the core area zonation. The core area zonation or CAS always looks for the cell with the least conservation value for removal. This typically is a cell with the most common feature or features. The core area zonation does not sum up values across features. In core area zonation, the highest conservation value is typically given to a cell with the rarest feature. Then we have the additive benefit function or the ABF. In ABF, the conservation value is a sum over all features present in a given location. The ABF has certain features that are appealing to conservation biologists, such as an emphasis on biodiversity feature richness and a built-in function for species area relationship. For those cases where it is important to set target coverages for feature ranking, zonation has a target-based benefit function option. When using TBF, zonation will maintain all features representation about a target level of protection as long as possible. Then the fourth systematic cell removal rule is generalized benefit function or GBF, which goes a bit beyond the scope of this course. And the fifth alternative is the possibility to create a random solution for comparison. So random ranking. Let's have a closer look at the core area zonation. This was the original cell removal rule used in the first zonation analysis. So in core area zonation, marginal loss is the maximum value within the cell across all features, and it is possible to give weights to features. If weights are not used, rarity drives the prioritization. In core area zonation, cell with the smallest maximum value will be removed. That cell is translated of having nothing of relative importance. And core area zonation emphasizes the most valuable feature in the cell. As a result, all species have high quality locations preserved in the top ranked areas of the landscape. For those who are mathematically oriented, the core area zonation can be expressed as a function with, which calculates the marginal loss of conservation value. As you can see from the formula, it is the maximum value of a feature in a given cell that drives the calculation when core area zonation is used. This effect is adjusted in terms of feature-specific weights and conservation costs. The core area zonation is sensitive to feature rarity by default. As a feature gets more rare in the landscape, its contribution to the overall conservation value gets more significant.
in more recent studies, the additive benefit function or ABF has gained popularity. The previous three feature example with purple, blue and yellow colored data layers utilized the ABF as the aggregate conservation value of each cell was defined as the combined value of all layers present in that location. Our example did not utilize feature weighting, but that is something commonly used in ABF prioritizations. In ABF, the cell with the smallest sum value will be removed, whereas in core area zonation, it was the smallest value occurring in a cell. Again, the ABF has a mathematical expression for cell removal. As the ABF calculates the conservation value for a given location as a sum over all features, it emphasizes feature richness by default. Again, feature weights can be used for fine-tuning the calculation and conservation cost is taken into account. ABF offers more flexibility in the way change in feature representation is translated into change in conservation value. These nonlinear power functions are based on species area relationship. Let's look at the difference between core area zonation and additive benefit function graphically. We have a landscape with four grid cells and two species. Each cell has one value for each species. Now in core area zonation, the conservation value of a cell is defined by the maximum value of any of the original features at that location. In additive benefit function, the original feature values are summed up to give the conservation value. Next, the cell with the least conservation value is removed. It was the same cell in both cases. Now, after the removal, now after the removal, the feature distributions have changed and the conservation value needs to be recalculated. Again, the cell with least value is searched for removal. And the conservation value gets recalculated. And the next cell gets removed. In the end of this example, both cell removal rules produce the same result. The cell removal process was identical, although the calculations for conservation value were different. In other words, the priority ranking outcome did not differ between core area zonation and additive benefit function. If we had a more complex example, we would see more differences between the removal methods. That was the opening part of the introduction to zonation. Thank you for listening.